Hey, everybody. It is so good to, to see everybody here. And to be honest with you, I loved watching the pictures of the kids and the schools. I even loved looking at the chat and seeing Claire spot herself in one of the pictures. So it's, it's all good uh, to do that. And this is one more event, uh, really, to try and help you get as excited as we are about joining the upper school and making that transition for next year. As we go through this, a couple of quick reminders. One, it's probably best for sound and everything if you keep your microphones off for right now um, and then use the chat if questions come up and the chat's that little box over in the corner with the lines and everything. Um, and we're gonna have a panel, you're gonna meet some phenomenal people, all of it to keep putting the people, because since we're such a school focused on relationships and building those relationships, putting the people out in front. So you're going to meet some students, teachers, um, you know, parents, everybody to try and help get you excited about the next stage in this adventure. And some of you I have known forever and others I haven't gotten to know yet uh, very well during your maybe short time in the middle school before you make this big step. But realize that everything we do at Flint Hill is very intentional, deliberate, and strategic. And it is all building on the building blocks that your children are experiencing right now in that eighth grade. And that really the upper school becomes kind of the culmination of the entire experience. And then you're going to hear from Jeremiah about the college counseling process, which I will tell you is the icing on the cake because we have just an incredible office uh, for people who have been in the, on the college side, who have read those files, and now they're working with us, helping our students get ready for that next step in their adventure uh, four years uh, from now and then looking ahead. So as you hear about the program, as you have a chance to ask questions, please realize that it really is a program that is incredibly dynamic, relevant, um, it is absolutely personal and meaningful, and it is one that truly is about passion over pressure. Uh, we really get the kids excited about their learning, excited to be active participants in it, and exploring not only their academic uh, plans and ideas and excitement, but the arts at an incredibly high level, uh, very competitive athletics, and then what I really love is true leadership development a chance to really take their core values and the vision and really build on that as they go forward. To give you just two quick stories very quickly to put some um, sense of where all of this leads as we even look down the road, because remember, we always say we're playing for the long game. We're not just playing for what their ninth grade experience is going to be like or their upper school experience. We're playing for what's going to come even, even further down the road. Two quick things. One, I, I've taught a lot of kids over my time here at Flint Hill. Uh, many of them keep in touch with me as they go off to college or whatever. I'd had this one great girl in class, really enjoyed getting to know her during her time here. You know, occasionally heard from her in college. She went to UVA, hadn't heard from her for a while. One day a letter comes in the mail and it's from her. And she's telling me that she wanted to write to pass on just the most amazing situation that had happened where she was now getting, she had just gotten her doctoral degree. She became a medical doctor. She had gone to UVA med school after undergrad school. She said, I was sitting there in the audience, getting ready to get up to get my diploma, thinking, how did this happen? How is it that in my life, I'm suddenly about to become a medical doctor? And she said, I tried to just sit there. How did it happen? And she said, all of a sudden, I was overwhelmed with images in my head of my teachers from Flint Hill. And she started listing the teachers and how she had learned a work ethic from this one and the science skills here and math. And she started going down and realized, good heavens, it, it really wasn't all those great teachers I had at UVA. It started with the humble confidence and the competence that gave me the courage to go after this but it came from the people I'd gotten to know and work with back at Flint Hill. And I read that letter to the faculty a few years ago because they deserve to hear that, that that was the ultimate benefit of everything they do here and the impact it had. 
The other thing had to do with sometimes I know if students are in the learning center and everything, and you know, parents sometimes worry, you know, is that going to be okay? Or are they going to be able to get into the right schools? Or, you know, even about athletics. I know there was a question I saw already about athletics and everything. And we have on average about 20 of our graduates every year go off to play college sports at one level. I will tell you, we had a student a few years ago who had been a great kid, wonderful kid, but he'd used the learning center all the way through from lower school to middle and clearly in the upper school. And in the upper school, they teach them this coaching model, getting them ready to become self-advocates and, and go forward. He also did love one sport. He loved basketball. So he'd been on the basketball team in the upper school. Good player, great three-point shooter, but he was never like the star of the team, didn't get recruited uh, by all the colleges the way some kids do. Applied to some great universities, got into his number one choice, which was Villanova, went to Villanova, was got into the business school at Villanova, which is a highly respected program. Knew he was going to have to work hard because he had his learning differences to, to go after. Got to college and realized, you know, he was going to miss playing basketball, but he had the chutzpah to go and introduce himself to the basketball coach at Villanova and asked if he could try and walk on the team. Coach said, well, I, I got to admire your guts doing that. He said, well, you can come to some practices and ultimately put him on the practice squad. And he played on the practice squad at Villanova his freshman year, his sophomore year, the whole time he's working hard at school. Junior year, the coach pulls him aside at the beginning and says, you know what? I've admired the, your courage. I'm putting you on the team. You get a uniform, a number, you're part of the team. Puts him in the program. He's there a part of the team. That year, while he's a junior, they win the NCAA Division I National Championship. And he's a part of that team. His senior year, he's on the squad again. He's going to graduate this year. There was no red shirting or anything. This was his senior year. This is what he was all about. Still doing well in the business school. Gets to the end of the year. Villanova made it to the final four again. And what I'd never heard of before, when any of the teams in the NCAA get to the final four, the NCAA has all four of those teams turn in the grade point averages of all of their players and they pick one player to get what's called the Elite 90 Award because the NCAA supports 90 different sports. So they turn them all in, and our Flint Hill graduate wins the Elite 90 Award with a 3.976 average in Villanova's business school. And just on the side, they won their second national championship that year. And he is now up in New York as a financial analyst. But that was a kid who went through Flint Hill in the Learning Center. It didn't hold him back one bit. If anything, it gave him the drive and ultimately the skill set on how do I make everything work? Because it comes from my motivation, my determination. But I'm doing it all knowing I'm supported by great teachers who are constantly there to help him and they help all of our students. This is a school that thrives on that energy, thrives on that active participation. And I know the upper school is absolutely thrilled to have this great class of 2026 getting ready now to make that move from being in that incredible middle school building to come now over to this amazing upper school facility and to be with these great, great teachers. So. I'm going to stop talking because those of you who know me well know I can just go. And uh, and that's not, not right and not fair to the other great people we have here. I'm going to turn it over to Don Page. Don has been with us this year. He has come in and just set a course of leadership in a, a personal caring way that has made it feel like he has been with us forever. And I'm going to let him go ahead and lead the way and talk a bit about the program. And then he's going to go ahead and moderate the panel uh, discussion and everything else. So please know if at any time you have questions that I can answer, don't hesitate to grab me either at carpools or, you know, on campus or whatever, or give me a, send me an email or whatever. I'll be glad to help you because I look forward to watching the progress of your great children as they go through our phenomenal upper school following that idea of it's all about passion and the driving spirit. 
So anyway, Don, I'll stop now and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. My my short anecdote is I had a, a meeting with Brian Lamont today. We were talking about bell schedules and I walked over I sat in his office. I took those 50 steps that I mentioned the last time we all got together. I sat down and he was helping a student with something. And I kind of looked around and I just realized that all these pictures on his wall were pictures of my current students uh, when they were in seventh and eighth grade. And I was looking at that kind of transition and like remembering them younger. It was, it was kind of this moment. It, it took me a while to start the meeting. So I was like, oh, there's Mackenzie. Oh. It, was, it was kind of great. It was something I had, I had seen but not noticed before. And so uh, I'm curious which of your children will eventually be in that same kind of situation. So um, my job here today is just to kind of moderate uh, the conversation. I have two of my colleagues here at the upper school with me, uh, Debbie Ayers, that many of you have met, who's our academic dean uh, and assistant director of the upper school. And I have Jeremiah Shepard here uh, with us, who's the sophomore class dean, uh, as well as one of our college counseling uh, uh, college counselors. And so they'll be here to uh, answer some of those questions. We also have some students and parents. And so I'm going to introduce them. Well, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a second. Uh, and I have some great questions that a lot of you submitted uh, um, that I'll start with. But then as things come up, if you have other questions, please feel free to you know put them in the chat. And we recognize we started uh, talking with our families uh, way back in the fall about the transition to high school because we recognize what a transition it is. Um, I've seen some of you on campus. Many of you have come to my office uh, to see me. Some of you have seen Ms. Ayers. Many of your children have toured the building and, and seen the building. And a constant reminder to us that though they're only 50 steps away, they might not fully understand what's what's happening over here and how things work. And so, uh, um, and some of them still have tours to come. I think my daughter is actually has a tour coming up this week or next week. So, um, but we wanted to use this as re-enrollment comes together to give anyone a chance, a last chance to ask anything uh, that we might have missed. So. To help us answer those questions, uh, we have some parents and students here with us. I'm going to go ahead and introduce the students first. Um, student, when I call your name, just introduce yourself. Tell us what grade you're in and tell us something unique that you do at Flint Hill. Maybe it's a sport, a club, an activity, whatever you want. So uh, let's, uh, Richie, if you don't mind starting. Hi, my name is uh, Richie Callis. I'm a current senior at Flint Hill, and I started the Breast Cancer Awareness Club. Nice. Thank you. Uh, Clara. Hi, I'm Clara Stevens. I'm a sophomore at Fun Hill, and I do discus and shot put. Nice. Uh, and Mary, are you here, Mary? Hi, my name is Mary Del Vecchio. I'm a freshman at Flint Hill, and I did soccer in the fall, and I'm also a part of the track team. Awesome. And we have two parents with us. Uh, let me see here. Liz, are you on the line? Hi, Don. Hi, everyone. Liz, tell us about your children at Flint Hill and something unique that they do. Okay, sure. I have a ninth grader. Her name is Lauren. And a junior, her name is Rachel. Uh, Lauren just started um, ceramics this semester, and she's loving it. And that's her first opportunity to do something like that. And Rachel is my junior. And I think what's unique about her experience is cybersecurity and how she's really developed that interest um, with the club and then with Mr. Snyder and with Ms. Ayers. That's awesome. And I believe uh, Jill, are you here? Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Wishkoff. I have two sons at Flint Hill. I have a son in seventh grade and I have a son in 10th grade. Um, something unique is my 10th grade son is an ambassador. Um, so he has students from admissions that sometimes shadow with him when they're looking at the school um, and he plays golf. That's awesome. That's a great kind of sampling uh, of all the different things that, that I see from students and parents. And so what I want us to start with was a question that came up in the registration process that I think all the students and all the parents could comment on or add to, and then we can kind of build off from there, because I think this is the largest question in many of the parents' minds, um, which is what kind of external pressures and challenges will the class of 2026 go through as they transition to high school, and what kind of advice could you give them for that? So we have parents here. Some of them might be having their 
fifth person moved to high school, some might, might be their first. And so a lot of them want to know what are the challenges and pressures they're going to go through in that transition and what recommendations could you could you give? So maybe we could start with the students and then the parents could kind of comment on that. Yeah, I can go ahead and get started. So when I first came to Flint Hill in ninth grade, I um, I was the on the soccer team, varsity soccer, and preseason starts before classes start. So I was pretty occupied with all everything I had to do there. And I didn't start in the way I exactly wanted to with school. So I would say you have to balance everything out and it does take time, but you have the teachers, you have everybody there who wants you to succeed. So you can really balance your time out perfectly. You, should, you have the resources and you have to use them properly. Thank you. Yes, I think I want to follow up with something on that. When you're moving into middle school to high school, a lot of, or upper school basically, a lot of it comes from being independent. And when you're so busy, you have to learn how to organize your own time, when to schedule your own things. Instead of doing what you want during office hours, you have to realize there's responsibilities you take to schedule your own time to work on homework, your own time to go talk to a teacher because your parents and your teachers are not gonna do that for you anymore. They're not going, they will, they will help you if you ask, but you have to take that step yourself. And it goes like out of school, you have to learn how to start scheduling your like practices for out of school sports, for in school sports. If you have a job, if you have homework, you have to start taking that extra responsibility for your own schedule. And it's kind of hard when you're so busy, but there are lots of resources at Flint Hill that can help. Yeah, I just want to reiterate that. Um, I was also going to say just independent, um, learning how to manage your time wisely, but just realize that there's also a lot of valuable source resources that you have at Flint Hill, whether that's your advisor or any of your teachers. They're really just there for you um, to support you during those times during office hours um, or any free periods that you have. You can always check in with them, emailing them, just keeping communication between your teachers is really key. Liz and Jill, what do you think? What are some pressures your children went through? Um, what advice can you give? Um, as far as uh, pressures, I would say the time management is for sure something that um, the kids need to work on. My younger one, transitioning from eighth grade to ninth, um, it was a big, I felt like she was very adequately prepared to make the move, but she had to take ownership of her time, which is what the, you know, the Flint Hill students are saying. I completely agree with that. Um, when I sat in on the conference with Lauren's math teacher, he had said, there's so many things, or actually it was the back to school video. And his said, parents, if you're looking to help your kids, you may not be able to know the math material, the best thing you can do for your child is teach them how to schedule their time or at least help them. And I thought that was the best advice he could give because if he told me I had to help Lauren with her math, <laughs> that, that, wasn't gonna, that wasn't gonna go over so well. Um, so that's been an adjustment. Now my, my junior, I think she was born with time management skills. Um, from the moment she wakes up, she's just trying to check things off her list and it sure it sure makes life a lot easier when you're always working ahead. So that would be my advice to any eighth grader coming up to ninth grade or to the parents. Teach your kid to work ahead. So ideally, they're not working on something that's due the very next day, if possible. Um, always get a really good night of sleep. Set a bedtime and stick to it. And I think that's probably the best way to avoid stress. Jill, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would just add, you know, I agree with everything everyone's saying. Um, the challenges that I definitely noticed was, I'm just going to come out and say it. There is a big difference in the homework from eighth grade to ninth grade. That being said, um, you know, we're such a student-driven um, community, and I think all the students here really touched on it. They're in the driver's seat. I would also say as the parent, um, the you have to give your child the, um, you know, put them in the drive. They're in the driver's seat and don't 
micromanage. This is the time where they begin to really show you they've, they've got it under control and utilize the office hours and the different breaks that they might have throughout the day um, and just really, you know, use their time wisely. And it's okay. Sometimes they might have to figure out that this didn't work and try something new, but um, I think it's just such an exciting time and such a um, big period of growth. I I'm excited for all of you because it it's really a great, great place to be. When, and Jill, you started leading into another question that was in there that I thought was really interesting because uh, I often see parents ask, what should parents do? But one parent asked in the registration, what should parents not do? And I, I feel like you were kind of getting to that. So maybe Jill and Liz, do you have other things of what you want to tell this group of things they should, uh, these parents should not do as their children go into ninth grade? Well, I'll pop, pop back on, and I'm sure if my son was down here, he would, he would say, please, mom, don't look at my grade book every second and ask me every, every moment about it. For the record, I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I would say that can't, I don't know if the students should look at it every second either. I think, you know, it's good to know where you're at. Um, but I think it could also, you know, things shift and move. But that's definitely one that I would add in. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great one. Thank you. Liz? Yeah, Don, I will add, um, I, I, I've told my kids, I never want to have to email your teachers. This is your relationship, not mine. And I wish I could get to know some of the teachers better because they, some of them sound so amazing. But I leave that to my kids and I've, I've stuck by that. That's saves. That's great advice. I saw in the chat, we had our first question was, what was the role of the advisor at the upper school? Jeremiah, as a class dean that works with the advisors, maybe you could feel that question? Sure, good evening, everyone. Um, I love, I, I took a couple of notes here because I think it's really easy and, it, and, it, and it's a valuable attribute to want our young people to develop a sense of independence and a sense of just being able to kind of take control of whatever's in front of them. But I really appreciated Mary's comment about, you know, students also being able to advocate for themselves and use the resources and seek the help. I think sometimes we put a lot on our kids' shoulders about you need to be able to handle all these things. And it's equally as important that they know when they need to be able to say, I need help with this load. So that's a nice segue into what our advisory program allows. It introduces our students to a partner that they can have, someone that's on faculty, someone that at the end of the day, they know that they have this person to turn to and go to, not just for help, but just, you know, someone to kind of let their guard down and just really know that I have at least one person in my corner. Um, we utilize a, a, a theory or, or a structure here in our advisory program called developmental designs. And the idea behind that is that that group of 12 to 13 kids and their advisor every morning for about 10 minutes has an opportunity just to really connect. There's a trend that's happening and, you know, COVID has just sort of exacerbated it a lot more where, you know, just people are yearning for connection. And before this happened, there was like a startling data point that showed that there are some kids in schools who can walk through a full day of school and never hear their name mentioned one time. And so the idea of our advisory meeting in the morning is a chance for people to just simply be seen, you know, to be recognized, to start their day knowing that they've been noticed and knowing that they have this consistent group that they can fall back onto um, for good and bad moments, you know, or trouble with the challenging moments. So the one difference that, you know, is that, that a lot of people sometimes don't realize is that our students coming into the ninth grade are assigned into an advisory group. So they're placed with a group of 12. I actually really love this design because it allows our students to really begin cultivating those skills that they need to make friends and social networks. But then after their, soft, after their freshman year, they um, are allowed to meet the uh, sophomore advisors and then they get to rank of those advisors, which group that they would want to be placed in. Once placed in that group, they're in that same group, grades 10, 11, and 12. So throughout their upperclassmen years, they really grow cl closer with that group over the next three years. And it's always interesting to see some sophomores who are a little reluctant about joining a group that they you know, aren't really sure about, and there's a bunch of new people, and they really aren't sure, to senior year, 
you know, their, their advisor and that group of 12 that they have are some of the tightest friendships that they have. And oftentimes the ones they get the most emotional about not being able to interact with once they go off to college. So um, I probably said a lot, but that in a nutshell kind of gives you, that's like my elevator pitch. I know it was longer than three minutes <laughs> about what our advisory program does up here. Well, then, and, and Debbie, maybe you could add what the advisor does with course registration. We're starting to have those conversations. We're getting into that season. And the advisor also beyond the kind of the, the, the social emotional role also kind of fills a more standard role that maybe some of our families are aware of. So maybe you could talk about that. Sure. So now is the time where our advisors are beginning to sit with students and think about what comes next in their course progression. So whether it is a eighth grader coming to ninth grade or um, our students who are already here returning for the upcoming year, the advisor um, introduces course progression with them. So it may seem logical what comes next, but with uh, many of our programs, especially math, there are different routes that you can take. And so being able to engage in a conversation about the experience of the previous class, what's going well, what do you still want to work on, how do you want to diversify your schedule for the upcoming year, those are just really granular conversations that can be happening before the student has to enter a course selection. And many of our advisors, well, actually most of our advisors are working with them in another capacity too. So your advisor might be a classroom teacher, might be a counselor to you. And so you have, you know, overlapping relationships, but by and large, every person in the school who's going to be selecting courses will have a chance to be able to sort of bat around some ideas for, for the best next step in our program. And and thank you, Debbie. And that brings me to something I wanted to bring in that both addresses questions, but a conversation I've had with some of you in, in meetings, and, and even something today struck me as kind of relevant to that conversation. And a lot of the questions that we received had to do with preparing students to apply for college. Like, what do we start doing with the ninth graders, you know, as soon as we're there? And uh, I was talking to a senior today who's in my office. We were just chatting. And I said, uh, um, hey, you know, I haven't had a chance. Uh, um, to say to you, like, congrats, you know, like I, I heard your good news. I just want to say congrats uh, um, and I'm, I'm happy. And he said to me, you know what, Paige, I'm most happy it's over. Like the process is over. And for even with the good news, that stream of that process, Richie is either in the middle of it or probably uh, the stress of that. And so what we really try intentionally to do is to do the things we know is going to help those students put their best self forward over four years without saying college, 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 college from the age when they're married until they're getting to Richie's grade, if that makes sense. I can see it in Richie's eyes the way he's kind of nodding. Like it is a horrible, stressful pr process. And so having deans that help with the curriculum that are also in the college office allows us to put things into that programming in terms of chasing passions, understanding projects that you can do outside of yourself, getting involved in a variety of different activities and trying new things without saying the word college all the time. So it doesn't feel like it's just a four year build upon you uh, uh, that. And, and I've been trying to find the right way to kind of express that. And when that senior looked at me today, who you would assume would just be in the greatest happiness, like, yeah, it's so great. He was just, you know, Don, I mean, Paige, I'm just happy the process is done for me. And he said, but I also know for some of my fellow students, they're still in it. So I'm trying to be really calm about it. And so we try and do that a lot in all of our programming. We try to build them up to have them take the classes that fit and are doing the most challenging for them, to push themselves the hardest, to engage in different things, whether it's community service. We have a, a whole work week dedicated next week to doing some of this work to outside programming, everything we do, to having seniors work with the ninth graders. But we don't tell them every week it's college counseling, right? Because it is the long game in, in all of this. And we want them to be authentically, passionately involved in the things they do. Um, because those things are in the end, the way that really shows them at them best selves. And even the senior said today, I felt like at the end, I was able to be authentic about what I love. And then I, I that led me to the place I needed to be. So. So I wanted to kind of bring that in. Um, let's see here. 
I see uh, um, uh, uh, Brett mentioned kids should not just advocate for themselves, but feel free to talk to teachers if they fall behind. Our sp son spent many afternoons with his teachers during his time at Flint Hill, which he attributes to helping get into the top school he now attends. I think that's absolutely true. We, uh, uh, if I could make a plea to parents, it is the message that going to see your teachers is a sign of strength, not a sign of weakness. And getting help and going during those office hours, we purposely build that free time in the day so that students can do that. And students often, when I say to them, hey, I wanted to chat with you about something. Can you run by my office? And they say, well, I was going to go to office hours. I was like, go, go, go. You and I will find another time. Um, and that I think that's absolutely true. And it helps build that strength for if you end up in a 300 person lecture hall and you need to see the professor, you have the, the social wherewithal to go do that. Or you end up working in a company one day where there's 900 employees and you want to talk to someone above that how you build that for the for the long game. Uh, um, so yeah, I couldn't agree more uh, with you, Brett. So um, I see uh, uh, Ms. Ayers addressed uh, DK's Kim's question about their role with us in, in course registration. Um, I see Christine asked, are eighth graders visiting the US uh, at the upper school? We had a day where all eighth graders visited and we took them on a little tour where myself, Ms. Ayers, uh, Mr. Shepard, and variety of others were kind of like little spot hosts and we would send them along uh, a little bit and then some have been coming to shadow classes and to have a visit day i know some happened in the fall and some were interrupted by the the COVID issues and so some have been rescheduled like i said uh, um, i know many of you parents know my daughter is part of the class of 2026 i think hers is next week um, and so if they haven't come they're coming uh, relatively soon uh, as well so um uh, Mrs. Robinson asks, can you talk about sports requirements? Do all freshmen that elect to fall sports start early during the summer? If so, what's the approximate start date? Uh, Ms. Ayers, do you know the answer to the approximate start date? Can you help me with that one a little bit? Sure. So um, first I see, do they all select or elect a fall sport? They don't have to. The requirement in the upper school are called activity credits, and there are four by the time they graduate. So they don't have to do one every season or every year even. Uh, those activity credits can be totally focused in the athletic realm, but at least two of them will be. And the other two might be something else, such as major minors or uh, being on the robotics competitive team. There, um, the, We've had uh, a lot of different opportunities uh, during the school day that can help earn the activity credit. The students who participate on the school newspaper or the yearbook that is eligible for an activity credit. But as to the question about when it starts, if they do play a fall sport, the preseason practices will begin about two weeks prior. And so they have an opportunity to connect with a group and really um, make some friends before that first day of school. But even if they don't, there's lots of bonding activities that happen during our first week of school that is very, they're very intentional about finding mm -hmm. a cohesion with our new class, with the new incoming students, and uh, just helping us get to know one another before we sit down to start learning. And, and Ms. Ayers, I'm glad you brought that up. Ms. Ayers and I, we, though we're on separate screens, we're about 15 feet from each other, and we were both just doing the same thing, which was reading admission applications of students who want to come to Flint Hill. And there are some amazing ninth graders coming in um, that we can't wait to have part of our community. And part of that advising model and what we do is also to make them feel like they're part of the community as well, to be so that we are not the middle school plus some students, but we are a new group that has come together. And so we do a lot of work towards that. Um, I know we have some of our admissions people on the call. I see a question about signing up for a shadow day. Is there anyone who could hop in and help with that if a student hasn't visited or wanted to visit? Hi, Don. This is Jennifer here. Hi, thank you for that question. Yes, absolutely. So we are still um, inviting students to sign up for shadow visits. And after the, the call today, we'll uh, re-link that, that form again so that you can get signed up for one. We'd love that. Great. Um, another question that was submitted that I think is a, is a great question uh, for us to talk about as, as, a, as a group is how do we balance at the upper school the students' privacy with the keeping parents in the loop, 
right? Uh, I think Jill referenced a little bit the open grade book, uh, um, you know, and I think each family kind of creates their own understanding about how often it's viewed and, and what they do in there. And, and I do think different families find different things that are right for them in that. But then also kind of socially uh, on uh, campus. Now, there are many things that we often will give like a warning to a student or have a conversation with a student that doesn't necess necessitate a parent call. So a um, child needs to pull their mask up or a teacher might have a conversation with a student about uh, being a little too disruptive. But when we see patterns, we always loop the families in because we know that families at home want to be partners with us in terms of some of that behavior. And so we try and think about that. And we always want the student, as this group is saying, to kind of advocate and, and assume responsibility at first but then when we see patterns, we want to loop those things in, particularly if we see patterns across uh, um, classes. And so a lot of the things advisors will do, one of the most common things they'll do is they might reach out and say, hey, you know, I'll use my name as if I'm a student. Hey, Don's in my class and he seems lost in his screen and not focused. Is anybody else seeing that same thing? And then each teacher kind of comments and it allows the advisor to be this person to see a whole picture to reach out. So we constantly try to balance those things in, in both in when we uh, address things with students, uh, when we are working with them. You know, the counselors have their own set of rules about privacy and looping parents in, in terms of when students visit counselors that they'll work through with, with the group uh, um, in, in that. But whenever we feel that there's a serious need or, or a pattern of behavior or something that would impact the child in, on a larger scale, uh, um, we reach out to families. So if your child is out of dress code the first time, you're probably not going to get an email from me. If we're worried about how your child is, is struggling in class and we worried something is deeper, you're going to hear from us. And that's how we try and think about it in, in a great deal. Um, and we ask the reverse of parents. So there are times parents will reach out to us to say, hey, Don, I don't want to go in deep into it, but if you can, uh, if you can uh, cut my child some slack today, it was a rough night last night. And you're always like, got it. And I send a word out, hey, everyone, we're just pulling back a little bit, so-and-so. We don't want to get involved. We, we don't need the details. And then sometimes families want to share more, and they'll come and sit with me to say, we want to walk through with some things going on. And so it's the same kind of thing, because we're in the same place and wanting to know where that child is at and wanting to know the right information without them feeling like we're just always over their shoulder at, at the same time. So um, let's see here. Um, anticipated class size for 2026. I think in on normal, we have about 140 students per grade. And so that's normally roughly where we uh, shoot for. Sometimes it goes a little more, a little less based on who comes in. You accept students and sometimes more students accept your acceptance. I'm, I'm using horrible admissions terminology, but I think everyone knows what I'm saying. Uh, and based on how many eighth graders stay with us. So, but we shoot for roughly 140. So that could be bringing in 50 new students. It could be a little more, it could be a little less. It kind of depends. But normally I think that's what we shoot for. But I see Jennifer popped in, so maybe she can help. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. Your your admissions terminology was just fine, Don. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, that's <laughs> that's exactly right. Um, the class size can expect to be about 140, 145, about half continuing and half we're welcoming from a variety of other schools. I, I see a question in the chat about athletics. Are they like that in the MS where uh, there are multiple teams for each sport and everyone who tries out will make one of the teams specifically interested in baseball? I can't speak directly to baseball, but what I can say is I know that not everyone, there are not multiple teams for everyone and there are tryouts and leveling that happens depending upon the sport, okay? So some of our sports that are really heavily subscribed, uh, girls volleyball, uh, uh, boys basketball, those kind of things might fill based on leveling. There are other sports that always are welcoming. If there's a ch child who wants to play a sport, uh, um, they often try to find a place for them. But I hear someone jumping in that can help as well. Yes, uh, at least for this year, they released like um, information about it very recently for baseball, very specifically. Oh, great. Um, for at least this year, I can just tell you what they have for this season that's going about to happen in about a month. Um, they have junior varsity and varsity. There are cuts, and they have about 12 to 18 people on every team. And they also have, like, more information, like varsity will play 18 to 26 games, and the JV will play 14 to 18 games. 
and some Saturday events are required for varsity. So if you want to know this, like what it might look like the next year, that's what it's like for specifically for baseball. Thank you, Clara. And so that information comes out and you can always reach out to the athletic director, but also sometimes it kind of depends on interest as, as programs build and, and uh, depending on each year and what's in the interest. So um, let's see here, making sure I didn't miss anything in the chat. Um, oh, would it be possible to have some of the students talk uh, to the eighth graders, share their experience about classes electives? That was what we, uh, did yesterday in, uh, we had a virtual session, very similar to this, just for the students. And we had some of our own students share some of those ideas about uh, the classes and the electives. Uh, um, Richie, Mary, Claire, were any of you in that session? Was there an overlap on that separation? Debbie, do you remember any of the questions they asked? Yes, they always have a lot of interest in our elective offerings and how to make a decision across the many um, arts that we have, as well as the innovation. Uh, some of the students were curious about how to balance everything. And then we had a few questions about students who might be taking two languages and whether or not that would fit in a ninth grade schedule. And we were happy to say yes, that, that we can make that happen. Um, it's, it's quite a buffet of offerings. And so the, the students were very curious about that and heard some really good responses from our upper schoolers. Yeah. Well, I'm going to end with this last question that always resonates with me, particularly when I work and, and talk to middle schools about them coming up to the upper school, whether it's a school that is part of a community I'm in or when I visit other schools in the area that, that come to the school I'm working at. And the question I hear from students a lot of times is, well, when do grades start to count? When do they start to matter? And what I always tell them uh, uh, is, quite honestly, the truth of the matter is, they always do, and they always do in the sense that this, the best way to succeed in upper school is to succeed in middle school. The work you do there is so important to the building that you'll do here. And then conversely, the best way to succeed in middle school is the way to succeed in lower school. And so if you're asking me, when do they go on the transcript? I hear that question and it depends on the class and when you take it, most of them start in ninth grade. But one of the things I always tell the students is some of the most successful things you will do next year, you will build a foundation in the next four months of those things with, with the teachers you have over there. And so what you do and what they do to build you there is so in instrumental here. And we have a great advantage of Flint Hill, which is our department chairs are seven through 12. And so our middle school and our upper school is one department that work together and, and uh, build a chain through all of that. We have a, a two hour delay coming up next week where we do professional development. And someone came to me and said, oh, you know, the seven through 12, they haven't met as a group in a bit. And I said, yep, that's what we're doing. Give it to them because they need that work. Uh, um, and so if, when you think about that with your child, make sure they know the assignments, the work they're doing right now in eighth grade matters so much to their success in, in ninth grade. So it all counts. Um, and I get it. A principal is supposed to say that, but many of you have known me long enough to know I mean it when I say it. It means so much. We are so thankful uh, um, that how many of you attended the different events, have come to on campus, your children have toured, you've come to see that. But keep in mind, as I said, the first time we were all over in the Learning Commons, I am only 50 steps away from that building. And the questions you might not have now, they might come up in two weeks, three weeks, whatever. Come find me. You know how to find me. I want to answer them. I want to be part of this process with you. Um, the relationship all of you had with, with Mr. Lamont, I want to be able to build that as well so that you know you can come find me whenever you have concern. Um, uh, keep in mind that um, re-enrollment contracts are due February 10th. I'm looking down at my script here to make sure I don't go off script from admissions. Uh, February 10th. Uh, we really appreciate those of you who attended all the meetings with administrators. Um, and just because this kind of season is coming to a close doesn't mean you can't ever reach out whenever you need to. Um, the thing I said to all of you that day was make sure you eat well, tell your kids eat well, sleep well, and ask questions. When you do those three things, you're going to be in great shape. And that goes for all of us. So, Jennifer, did you want to close? 
That was beautiful, Don. Thank you so much. If you have any questions about the re-enrollment contracts, which you received today and are due on the 10th, um, you can certainly reach out to, to me or, or Ann Peterson or, or Sarah Burnett, depending on the, the area of your, your question. And that should all be pretty clear in the, the enrollment contracts. So uh, just let us know if you have any questions about that. We'll get the, the email out uh, at some point tomorrow, which will have the opportunity to sign up for the upper school student visit if if your child hasn't already done that. And um, thank you to, to all of our panelists and thank you to, to all of you, your, uh, you parents for attending.